Okay. We're here today with uh, Dr. Pamela Gay. She is giving us a Google Hangout uh, seminar today. Dr. Gay is an astronomer, writer, and podcaster focused on using new media to engage people in science and technology. Through CosmoQuest.org, she works to engage people in both learning and doing science. Dr. Gay received a BS in astrophysics from Michigan State University in 1996 and a PhD in astronomy from the University of Texas in 2002. She currently teaches at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Her research interests include her first love, variable stars, as well as galaxy evolution and planetary surface geology. Today, in addition to our astronomy research, she focuses on efforts to on trying to understand why people engage in science in their spare time, which is also known as citizen science. Please welcome Dr. Gay. Thank you very much for joining us today. It, it's really kind of funny to have this random audience of seven guys eating pizza in a room and the whole internet out there as well. Um, and, and I love the classic red uh, plastic. Yeah. Red solo cups are the thing that kind of defines university. Uh, we well, trust us, it's only soda pop. There's no other beverage. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. Um, th this is a particularly nice talk for me to be giving. Back when I was at Michigan State, I was president of our Society of Physics students and really worked to try and get the program reinvigorated down there. And uh, so it's just nice to be back with a SBS chapter. So many, I'm afraid to say, over a decade later. Um, so I, I'm here tonight to talk to you about citizen science and I'm actually uh, going to screen share some slides so that you don't have to look at my uh, rain destroyed hair any longer than you have to. Um, and instead I'll show you some beautiful graphics. So so CosmoQuest is, is a project that we came up with back in 2011 and by we I mean Fraser Kane and I brainstorming in a bar which is where all good ideas come from I think. And what we were thinking about was this problem with not going to the next slide in this mode. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, hold on, let me, I'm apparently going to have to subject you to the navigator window while giving this talk, sorry about that. Um, I will try and make this so that they are as minimal as possible. Okay, so, so what we were trying to figure out is, is how to address new data problem that we have in astronomy. Basically, back over 50 years ago, this spacecraft, Mariner 2, became the, the first instrument to send back data from another world that was more than just reflected starlight. Instead of using a telescope to look at a planet, we flew there and we directly measured the temperature of Venus. And with this spacecraft capable of holding a whole 600 bytes of information, we were able to realize that Venus is not the tropical paradise that science fiction writers of the time had hoped, but instead was a death causing many, many hundreds of degrees. And modern science was started. Since then, we've, we've systematically stepped through our whole solar system, going to Mercury, Venus, over and over and over. We keep going back to the moon. We've visited comets, and in fact, on Sunday, we are going, well, not we, luckily, I have nothing to do with this because it's a truly terrifying prospect. They're going to try on Sunday to land the Philae lander on Rosetta, which, uh, sorry, on uh, CG67. Philae is a lander that's flying on the Rosetta spacecraft and the comet that they're trying to land on is actually shaped like a rotating rubber duck. Uh, 
and it's rotating around an axis that sort of comes out one ear and goes out through the other leg. So to say it's asymmetric and rotating along a weird axis is kind of an understatement. And they're going to try and land this lander on the back of the head of this rubber duck-shaped comet. And no one's quite sure how well this is going to work, but we're going to try because, well, you don't get science without risk. So we've now gone to a, a number of different comets. We keep going back to Mars because this is that one world we keep hoping to someday col colonize. We visit asteroids and we're slowly learning that uh, these potato-shaped rocks may not be the best sources to go mine minerals, but they may be the place to go to get helium-3 and other volatiles. We've gone back to Jupiter, we've studied its atmosphere, its moons, we're still at Saturn with the Cassini probe and we'll be there for another four years. We've somewhat underexplored Uranus, last going to it when I was young enough that my parents made me take a nap to see the Voyager 2 data coming back, and we've been to Neptune um, again in the 80s. We need to go back to the outer solar system. And, and we're working on it. Next summer, the New Horizons space probe is going to make it to Pluto. And we're finally going to have scientific data to add to the argument on whether or not this little world should be called a planet or a, well, dwarf planet. And what's kind of awesome is we're not just going back to Pluto next summer, but we're also going to the asteroid series, which is another object that was once called a planet. So by the end of next summer, we will have visited all of the places in our solar system that have ever been classified or misclassified as a planet. Now, as we go, um, the type of data that we're getting back has evolved. We're no longer getting back 600 bytes like we did with Mariner 2. Instead, well, there's this spacecraft called Solar Dynamic Orbiter, SDO. And it sends back, some days, 1.4 terabytes. We, we have gone, within the lifetime of, if not your parents, your grandparents, from sending back as much data as I probably tweet each day, <laughs> to sending back more information than my happy-go-lucky little laptop would be capable of holding. This has changed how we do science created a, a new data challenge where the old model of one scientist would systematically work with one or two other scientists and learn absolutely everything that could be learned from those 600 bytes of data to instead desperately trying to write software to triage through the terabytes and terabytes that were coming through at an unbelievable rate. And and this means that we're getting back more data each day on objects in our solar system than we as an entire scientific community have the capacity to explore. We can't look at all of the images coming back of Mars and several years ago there was an avalanche discovered on Mars quite by accident. A woman working on the project was like insert whatever expletive you feel like, I'm sure cursing was involved. Um, I just want to look at the pictures coming back from my spacecraft. And so she basically said, give me the most recent 50 pictures, send them to the printer, sat down, started flipping through them, and lo and behold, in one of those images, she saw that the spacecraft had taken a picture at the moment that an avalanche was occurring down the side of a crater by accident. Now, there's not a lot of time that we're allowed as professional scientists to have those happy accidents. Instead, we're always relying on our software and we're putting data into archives that we just don't have the time, the staffing, or the money to deal with. So in order to try and take on that data, we created this site, and this is our original layout. Um, back from 2011. We created this site that is designed to say, okay, there's all this extra data out there. There is all of this stuff we could be learning 
and explore, work on this together. And so we start with the basic question of what would you like to explore today? Now today the site looks a whole lot more advanced. Um, we have a lot more science sites front and center and we're actually engaging people just like you in exploring the moon and exploring Mercury and exploring Vesta. And, and what we're trying to do is change the paradigm of who does science. Because a lot of people when they think of scientists, they think of someone who's not too different from, well, Dr. Horrible. They think of some dude in a lab jacket who's probably slightly crazy, not necessarily good for society, and he has things boiling and bubbling and electricity going through them. And this isn't the image that we need people to have of what a scientist looks like. If First of all, we want them to learn science and vote in a responsible manner. And second of all, if we want them to help us, well, by supporting us doing science. And sometimes we want them doing science and we don't want them to think, well, you have to be some genius in order to discover something in our universe. So we're trying to change this paradigm. And, and what we're trying to get everyone to understand is we have this problem of too much data or in other citizen science cases we need people with backyard telescopes we need people with weather sensors in their backyard and we have a problem of needing distributed data that we can't get any other way and so we have these science problems and we need volunteers from the public to help us address these scientific problems and together we can create new knowledge if we can just get people to see themselves as part of the scientific process. And in designing CosmoQuest we decided we want to not only ask people to come in and be click workers but we want to treat them the same way that well our top students at universities are treated. We want them to have access to seminars, to classes, to being able to walk down the virtual hallway and say, hey, what do you think of this idea? We want to host star parties and have planetarium shows. And at the end of the day, we want them to do science. So over the past several years, we've systematically worked to build all of these different things into CosmoQuest. And this is what our science sites look like today you can go in, you can work on marking craters and we're trying to get people to mark craters that are more than 18 pixels across. These images are actually of sufficiently high resolution that if, if the tallest of you were to go lay down on the surface of the moon we could see you in these images. These are half meter per pixel or better, in some cases 20 centimeters per pixel images of the moon. We're able to make out the paths traced out by the footsteps of the astronauts across the surface. We're able to see the spacecraft and see the shadows even of the Apollo's flags that were left behind. That's how we know they're still standing is we can see their shadows. Now the thing is when you're starting to map things out at nine meters is the features that you're looking to map that room you're in is probably way bigger than nine meters mm -hmm. so we're trying to map the surface of the moon at a resolution where we're trying to map everything the size or smaller of your classroom wow. now we can't do that ourselves We've tried writing software to do it, but the best algorithms out there get somewhere between say, 70 and 80 percent accuracy. And, and the problem is that the topography of the moon is kind of rolling, that the soils vary in color, that the sun has this nasty habit of appearing to move through the sky and creating shadows that have a variety of different angles. And software just can't deal with all of the differences from one crater to another and human beings can do a significantly better job and in fact groups of utterly untrained citizen scientists working with CosmoQuest can do a significantly better job than the software. Wow. 
this particular image shows the results from roughly 15 different users who all marked the exact same image. Some of them marked things that were bigger, some of them marked things that were smaller, but using clustering algorithms that are able to figure out what is the most likely radius and center of these circles, we're able to build maps of the surface of the moon. And the cool thing is, these maps are actually no worse than the maps produced by professional astronomers. Now this is a really, really messy image to try and share across the internet. But what it shows at the top is we did the first ever study of getting multiple professional crater markers to go through and map an area of the moon. We had eight different people. We asked them to map the surface using whatever their preferred professional software is. Sometimes this is software that costs thousands of dollars per license. We asked two of them to also go through and use the moon mapper software. And then we looked to see what is the dispersion between the markings made by all of these different professionals. Well, the nice thing was the two sets of data taken using moon mappers fell right down the median of all of the other markings. So we know that our software is pretty accurate and allows our professionals to successfully mark at the average of, of the population's markings. The other thing we found is average apparently really matters because there is anywhere from a 4 to a 17 pixel variation um, between how the different populations are able to measure these things. So the, the experts, they're kind of all over the place. They're all finding the craters, but they're all over the place. Well, then when we look at the amateurs, we find they're all over the place, too. But the median of both populations is exactly the same. And the median number of craters counted is a one-to-one -one correlation between the expert and the volunteer identifications. Now, the one thing that we found looking at all of these experts is there's as much as a 30% difference in the number of craters counted between the uh, people who have the most and the people who have the least. And that 30%, that relates to a difference in our age estimates of a billion years. Now think about that for a minute. The moon is four and a half billion years old. And we get a difference of one billion years in the age estimated between the person who marked the most craters and the person who marked the least among the professionals. So we went through, we looked at all of our different professionals, and we looked at a comparison in the scatter, and we found that in general the pros do have less scatter. They go from 5 to 10 percent scatter in location. The volunteers are consistently at about 10 percent. The experts have 5 to 10 percent scatter in diameter and this is across a variety of different radiuses. Um, the volunteers typically have about 20 percent scatter in diameter. But there's this one-to-one -one relationship between what happens when you look at the averaged value of the experts and the averaged value of the volunteers. This means that we're able to get more scientifically accurate results by asking a room full of citizen scientists to go through and mark images than we can get by asking one professional who's been doing this since the Apollo era. Because that one person's intrinsic error is going to be significantly higher than the error of that group of volunteers. Now, we've gone on to look at other worlds. This is our asteroid mappers interface with all of the different examples and tutorials turned on. This is a really neat little asteroid. Its surface is truly deformed because at some point in Vesta's past, it underwent a massive collision that actually squished in the south pole of the asteroid and created wrinkle ridges around the equator of the asteroid. Um, put a different way, it was hit real hard in its south pole and it got all sorts of wrinkles around the waistline. 
um, it had a hard past and this is reflected in its surface. There's these weird wrinkles, these weird deformations and craters of all different shapes and boulders adhered to the surface. We're going through and we're working to map all of these different things out and what we're finding is in this graph that has the worst color scheme ever to send across the internet, um, the results comparing the public to our postdocs is again a one-to-one -one relationship. So we've repeated our results for two different worlds. Now, trying to get everyday people to sit down and spend all of their spare time doing science isn't always easy because let's face it, there's an entire internet out there. But in addition to asking for volunteers to spend their time while watching TV, also marking craters, we're also working with teachers to, instead of getting their kids to do whatever busy work seems to best teach the current federal standards on what you're supposed to do in the classroom, we're instead saying, let's spend that time in your classroom doing actual science, working on actual NASA programs. So we're partnered with a variety of programs to train teachers, we're creating content to use in the classroom, and we're working to distribute it across the entire English-speaking world, both through NASA Wavelength and through Europe's Open Discovery Space program. We also are trying to get people informed and interested, and I think this is part of, of how you guys may have found me. Um, we produce a lot of media content, all under the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. Um, we have a variety of audio content, we do a variety of different hangouts on air, um, and, and we're working to do everything from producing a weekly news show called the Weekly Space Hangout to bringing you interviews with the people behind the Google Lunar X Prize who are trying to figure out how are we going to return to the moon, not just in our lifetime, but in the next year. And, and so we're working to try and inspire people to learn science through this media and then come do science on our website. Um, we also know that mobile apps are kind of all the rage and sometimes one way to get people sucked into doing science is to show them it's not boring. Uh, we've created this app, it's available in both the iPhone and Google Play stores. Um, it's just called Earth or Not Earth and the goal of the app is to get people to answer the seemingly, seemingly simple question of is this Earth or not Earth, and it's actually a surprisingly difficult question where I've, I've taken great delight in walking up to people who study planets in our solar system and saying, hey, you want to play? And they'll get 10 or 15 in and then completely screw up Antarctica for the surface of Ganymede or objects on Mars for objects here on Earth. And so we, we have all of this so that you can work on learning science on your phone while you're at the bus and once you're done being enthusiastic maybe, well, get someone else learning science this way. And we also recognize that people get trapped in planetarium shows on a regular basis, uh, sometimes because they want to be there, sometimes because they're dragged there by a spouse or a teacher. Well, once we get them there, we want them to love the fact that they're there. So we're helping planetariums across the world create new and exciting content that will hopefully encourage people to learn more about science and get engaged in doing science. We've released our first Creative Commons planetarium show. Um, it is called Cosmic Castaway and it tires get torn out of galaxies during collisions and we're hoping in the future to start creating the planetarium shows that will tell the stories of, of scientists just like you who don't yet have their college degrees and are studying and have made great discoveries and tell the stories of the everyday people that are helping to support professional, soci professional science by making those observations in their backyards. So, so this is kind of CosmoQuest in a nutshell and I just discovered once again that if you put me in front of a live audience I happily go on for 45 minutes but if you put me on the internet I talk really fast because there's just not a lot of audience feedback. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a whole lot of time for questions I think. Fantastic. Thank you.
All right. All right, John, fire away. Um, yeah, I'm curious on what kind of software you're using, like what programming language we're using for uh, uh, tracking those critters. Um, we've built everything in HTML5 using uh, PHP and JavaScript. Um, I know PHP is not the fastest language out there, but there's a lot of really good libraries that we could build on, a lot of really robust documentation. Uh, everything is living on Amazon Web Services, and we use Apache servers in a Linux environment. Um, well, I don't, I don't mean as far as the website. I mean, before using CosmoQuest, what did you guys use to automatically track um, the creators? I, so <laughs> this, this is going to sound horrifying, but uh, random, poor, innocent, tortured graduate students would dedicate four years of their lives to drawing little tiny circles on the surfaces of worlds. Um, one awesome scientist, uh, Stuart Robbins, was tortured for four years at University of Colorado Boulder, uh, making a map of roughly 600,000 craters on Mars. And he estimated that he probably created several million circles in the process of creating that map because he looked at some of the craters at multiple different scales and from multiple different cameras to make sure that he had good overlap in his coverage. And he went back and redid areas to make sure his results were consistent over time. So uh, software, not so much. Human beings being tortured, primary route. Um, lots of different individual scientists have tried to write cratering finding code. Um, not all of it has been created equal. Um, and, and all of the code works differently well on um, different types of surface, unfortunately. What we're in the process right now is our lead programmer, Corey Leon, is trying to see if he can use the maps that are being generated by our citizen scientists to see if it's pos possible to use neural networks to create the better algorithm. We're not sure, um, but that's the experiment that we're running right now. Okay. Could, could you explain a little bit about how the, the crater maps tell us something about uh, the history of the solar system or sort of what's the, the background to, to wanting to know that distribution and size of the craters? So, so mapping these craters actually has a variety of different purposes. Um, first and foremost, we're creating a detailed catalog that can be used both when you're trying to define landing sites and science sites and also can be used to work on aging uh, the surface of the moon. If, if you think about it, if you stand beside a completely raked even Zen garden and you just sit there throwing ice pellets that then melt, if you continually throw these ice pellets over time and you throw them randomly, you'll build up this distribution of craters across the, the sand that the number of craters is directly proportional to how long you've been throwing these ice pellets. In this case, now change that to being asteroids hitting the moon and vaporizing instead of melting uh, during the impact. Now, if someone comes along and wipes free a particular section or bounces a basketball in a particular section, that's going to erase the craters in that section. So when you then count the craters in that section, there's going to be fewer. So when we look at the surface of the moon, the areas that we see that are mostly smooth, we know have probably most recently either suffered an impact or they've been filled in with Lava. We can usually differentiate by looking to see, is it the bottom of a crater? Is it a lava mare, a lava sea on the surface of the moon? The areas that are particularly craggy or particularly filled with all sorts of craters, those are the oldest surfaces on the moon. So we use this for age dating. The other thing that's nice about craters is when you have the combination of craters and lava tubes, you sometimes end up with skylights into underground caves that you can find at the bottoms of these craters. Now those caves rep 
the perfect place for human beings to go live eventually. The surface of the moon is pretty dangerous. It's up above the Earth's magnetosphere. So you're looking at a place where there's really nothing to stop the radiation from killing you, which is generally, I consider, a bad thing. If you can get under the surface of the moon, you can get out of the radiation hazard zone. You can live a little bit longer. You don't have to worry as much about solar flares. We got really, really lucky with the Apollo astronauts. All it would have taken was one improperly aimed um, coronal mass ejection, and we could have lost a crew to radiation. So far, we've been lucky. But we need to have those caves to go hide in in the future. Um, we're also just trying to understand the geology of the moon. When you see a crater that has edges that seem to be somewhat terraced, that can be because of the surface of the moon is made of multiple different consistencies. Just like if your cat bounds into the snow in the winter and then bounds back out and the cat imprint has a hard crunch down layer from the surface of the snow that's more icy, and then a really muddled, filled-in crater underneath from where the snow was soft and fluffy. Well, you get these similar concentric craters on the moon from having these differences in density. There's a whole lot of different stuff that we're working to get at. Um, at the core of all of it is some poor schmo or a whole lot of people who have some extra time to volunteer need to go through and make these detailed maps. Um, it really kind of sucks that so often it is some poor schmo. But thanks to CosmoQuest, we have a better answer. We have a let's all work to explore the moon together and then go visit it. So that's kind of what we're working toward. If not us, then the robots. I'm happy to have the robots invade the moon. All right, George. All right. First of all, I want to uh, say that your work is impressive, and uh, I have two small questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I want to know if besides the work that you do, you're interested in looking at the uh, existence of life on uh, the moon or what is not. OK, I heard the existence of, and then it kind of got lost. Could you be louder, please? Uh, the existence of life is the moon. It, it's the sound is getting pixelated. Can you come closer? I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, so I want to know if besides the work that you're doing right now, if you're interested in knowing uh, if there's a uh, life existence on uh, those uh, the moon or the other planets that you study. And also the second question, I want to know if with the season science project, you're interested in attracting more women science and astronomy. Does that Did you catch both of them? Yeah, I, I finally caught both of them. Thank you for your patience with the horrible internet. Um, so, so the first question was, uh, am I interested in looking for life? Yes. I don't know how you can be alive and have a heartbeat and not be interested in the basic question of, is there other life in our solar system, in our universe? Um, I'm really hoping that we're going to start being able to send out the technology to look for bacterial and other small organism life that requires probably a microscope um, that may be scattered throughout our solar system. There is liquid, salty water, briny water, um, theorized to be um, not too far beneath the surface of Mars, and I'm pretty confident in the results they're having that yes this this is liquid albeit very salty water that that is there at least in the summer months that could support all sorts of extremophiles we're finding subsurface oceans on a variety of different moons scattered throughout the solar system uh, we know that Europa for instance probably has vast subsurface oceans with volcanism beneath it that is driving convection driving um, all sorts of chemical reactions potentially within that sea. These are all potentially places that could be harboring life, um, requiring different chemistry than we're use, used to. Titan has a rich methane-ethane environment where both of these things exist at their triple point. So you have weather, you have geology, you have lakes. 
all of these different processes, rain and snowstorms, all on Titan in a methane-based environment. So I, I want to go out with a robot, not myself, send something very well sterilized. I don't want to be like the alien version of smallpox blankets. We've, we need to celebrate life, not kill it. Um, I want to send robots out that are capable of doing the needed science to see if that's out there. And it's entirely possible that within the next few years, we're going to start detecting the atmospheric signatures of highly polluting life forms in other solar systems. We, we actually have that technology. We can see various different chemicals in the atmospheres of other worlds. We're just still trying to find the small worlds. Right now we're looking at giant planets that make Jupiter look tiny in a lot of cases. Um, so I kind of don't think it would do our society a lot of good to know there's other civilizations out there because of paranoia and insanity, but the potential is out there and it would be nice to have confidence in our civilization's ability to deal with the discovery of far distant coal burning societies that are easily identified by how they destroyed their atmosphere. <laughs> um, so, so the other question was about getting women involved in science. Yes, I, I want to see more and more women engaged in science. I'm not quite sure how we ended up there, but the majority of our staff at CosmoQuest has actually been women at all levels except for programming, and that's simply a factor of the university I'm at doesn't have very many women in our, our computer science department. Um, but we've had female science leads. We've uh, had uh, science educators. We've at every level, including planet, planetarium show CGI programming. Um, and and I hope that as we continue to develop programs into the future, we can continue to inspire women, to engage women, to employ women, and slowly our one small program doing the best it can change the face of who is doing science. Other questions? Jordan? So the, the data that you gather from citizen scientists using CosmoQuest, uh, how are you able to, um, to say that it's valid, uh, like as, as compared to a, to a professional doing it? Like a, how do you account for, uh, for people maybe messing up, you know, doing, uh, drawing two big circles around the, the stuff, you know, people who aren't trained and that kind of stuff? Are you right. able to say that it's uh, good enough for, for, like, writing research papers on the data that you gather from them? We, we've, we've already published our first paper. It's in the journal Icarus. Um, we've blogged the bejesus out of it on our website. Um, this, this is just a randomly selected image. Um, nothing special about this one. It was just the most recent one at the moment that I created this talk. Um, we, w the way we validate our data, first and foremost, was we did the whole overly statistically uh, thorough comparison of experts and volunteers and discovered that both have their moments and do poorly. But as a whole, a group of volunteers does well. The algorithm that we have to group all of these craters has a threshold value that says a crater needs to have been marked by this many people. <laughs> It also goes through and it has the capability that we don't always use, um, but it has the capability to assign different um, users goodness values. So if their crater markings are consistently near the median value, they'll get higher goodness values. If they're consistently marking things no one else has marked, um, they get flagged to be reviewed. Um, and, and so that goes into weighting different people's data. But as a whole, once you say how many people marked this, and then look at the variation from too small to too big, what we find is that median value is a one-to-one -one correlation with the professional's median value. The statistics in the paper we have published in Icarus um, 
that paper, by the time we were done running all of the statistical tests that were needed to convince the referees that our results were as good as we said they were, um, it ended up having more pages of math than my entire master's thesis. So this was rigorous in the extreme and I work with a great group of collaborators who did most of that work with me just needing to help with database calls. Wow. So uh, I definitely want to get a hold of that paper and I'll find it on CosmoQuest. Can, can you tell us basically how many participants you had uh, on average for the statistics? Um, so we get 15 people per subset of the image. So the big image that I showed you, we, we divided it up into all of these little tiny pieces. I don't remember exactly how many people participated in that, but I want to say it was a couple hundred altogether. Okay. Okay. So, so a lot of these students are also taking a, um, a, a junior, senior laboratory class, and we go through the statistics and the, the proper uh, ways of minimizing your uncertainty. And so they know they're familiar with that uh, square root of like 1 over n or n minus 2 that pops up. So is right. that sort of why you're able to, to, to demonstrate that by increasing the number of participants, you're driving down that uncertainty in the mean by looking at bumping up how many people are inputting that data? The, the, the number of people that you need actually plateaus. Because if you okay. think about it, we're not going to do better than um, the resolution defined by our images. Right. So we we can't do better than oh. um, what our images allow. And then at a certain level, if if all of your users are having a certain tightness of fit, mm -hmm. um, you need fewer. So for experts, we used eight experts. Um, for our volunteers, we used 15 oh. volunteers. And and so what we're finding is 15 seems to be about the right number of people. It's overkill in some cases, but you never know when you're going to get four eight-year-olds. <laughs> but uh, so so this is this is where we landed based on yes, you do get better values by having more people mark, but you're limited by your tools, and and so we could only achieve so good in our tools. Wow, that's kind of cool. All right, John, ask again. Um, I might have missed it, or I'm just not going to pay attention. Um, but did you say there were like uh, incentives for doing this? Like you build up points or something like that? Or, uh, we're, we're not right now. So right now it's it's you get to feel good about yourself and potentially get your name on a paper if you discover something awesome. Um, and every image you can look to see who's responsible for the data in that image. Uh, we are in the process of developing a badging system. In the next couple of weeks we're going to release to beta a massive upgrade to our site that is going to enable the slow badges of groups of all sorts of additional new features um, that will allow us to start incentivizing it. Um, I have to admit this is one of those things they don't teach you about when you're studying to be a PhD astrophysicist. Um, my entire academic career I was told don't play video games, you need to be studying. Um, and this whole now you need to gamify your citizen science site is sort of like, huh. But I have a great team of programmers that are working to figure these problems out for me because gamification is not something. I know how to play Plague Inc. on my phone. Um, yeah, I'm a table cut top kind of girl. I admit that. <laughs> so to me, it's it's just it's remarkable. It, is CosmoQuest the first citizen science-based astronomy? Um, project? No, actually citizen science with astronomy has a long tradition going back over a hundred years. Okay, tell us um, a little more about that. So, so with the American Association of Variable Star Observers, they came out of the fact that Edwin Pickering at Harvard College Observatory realized in the late 1800s that there were all of these amateurs who enjoyed astronomy, many of whom were starting to build their own telescopes, who were perfectly capable of going outside, looking up, um, 
measuring the comparative brightness of different variable stars and logging this information. If you go to the AAVSO website, you can actually download visual data on the very bright uh, variable star Myra, Omicron SETI, that spans back to the late 1800s. As Pickering started to realize that this was a real capability the amateurs had, um, he started encouraging people, well, here are these stars, here are these stars, and over time it built into a very professional organization where now the Hubble Space Telescope relies on backyard astronomers when it's getting ready to make observations of certain types of novae that have a tendency to flare up amazingly bright and you don't want a star to be flared up when you're about to point the Hubble Space Telescope at it. Mm -hmm. So all the way back astronomers have partnered with, with amateurs and in fact um, the discoverer of the planet Uranus, uh, William Herschel, he was a composer and an oboe player and his little sister Caroline was the solo soprano for their city's orchestra. Um, these were people that taught themselves everything they knew about astronomy and went on to log thousands of previously uncharted nebulae and galaxies, they didn't know they were galaxies at the time, uh, to discover comets and to indeed discover a planet. Wow. That's, that's, that, to me that's really remarkable. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's any other field of science that has really embraced um, that amateur slash quasi-professional like astronomy has. In the physical sciences, it's pretty much just astronomy. Yeah. Um, geology, uh, which is another flavor of planetary science, um, also engages the public a fair amount um, in, in things like trying to determine how acid rain is eroding different rocks. And you can do that by looking at how granite headstones erode over time. Mm -hmm. um, there are a variety of biology projects actually. The Cornell Ornithology Lab and the Audubon Society engage people in studying um, distribution of birds, bird populations, bird habits, um, just by looking at their backyard feeders. And there's even programs to, to study the collapse of the bee, bee population by having people plant flowers that are particularly tempting the honeybees and then spend five minutes a day looking to see just what pollinating critters come and visit those unfortunately not very often honeybee populated plants because we do have a loss of honeybees in this nation. Wow. It seems like the biggest incentive is, is not to, to get coins on the website but to be able to like contribute to the to the greater knowledge you know without having, needing to have a PhD. Yeah that that's entirely Unfortunately, what you have to do is think about the difference between short-term engagement and short-term. I, mean, I, I think of games like Candy Crush and Dots where they work to give you those badges right off the bat so you're like, when's the next one I get? And then eventually you're simply addicted and you have no choice to play because there's this voice in the back of your brain. So we need to have that gamification to get people past that initial I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here phase that, that you go through in your learning new software and to get them to that confident, addicted, purposely trying to explore the universe phase of discovery. Cool. What, what do you have a, a new project, a, a new citizen science project that extends beyond the, the crater mapping? Something new that's coming on the horizon? Can you share with us? Uh, we're going to be working with the Vesta project to look to uh, map out the splatter of different soils across the surface um, to, to try and get an idea of the diversity of soils on the surface. Um, we also have some projects on the horizon that are still at the unfunded stage that are extremely exciting and one of the problems that we're dealing with like so many other problems is we don't have a Congress that loves science and so the money out there is is we have all these great ideas and we're just not quite sure where the funding's going to come from right now. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. So most of the funding in the past has come from NASA. NASA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. And, and the program that has consistently fund, funded us and many other excellent programs, unfortunately that entire funding program has been canceled. So we can't take it personally when it's the same place that also funds like astronomy picture of the day. Yeah. Um, but it still does leave us in a lurch. So we are trying to figure out how to deal with that. Has, has there been any interest from like large tech giants like Google in terms of supporting this this kind of stuff? Because it seems like it would play a lot in. Of, a lot of the large tech giants want a business plan on how you're going to eventually become profitable. Tech money. Uh, right. And and we don't really have that sustainability plan. Right. So so yes, we are pursuing private funds, but it's harder than you might think um, because while we can have long term missions and visions defining what we want to explore and to discover, um, the type of science we're doing isn't going to earn anyone a buck. So it's it's complicated. You don't go into science because you want to earn money. Unfortunately, right. um, if you study salaries, the the worst ratio of income to education is for academics. <laughs> it is what it is. Now listen to her. She's not telling you a story. <laughs> no, I'm not. Find your vow of poverty today, or plan to marry very well. <laughs> <laughs> Those are your options, folks. I do voice work occasionally because that way I can afford a new iPhone. <laughs> so we've got a student here, uh, Alex, in the back, who uh, kind of runs our planetarium. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about your um, your open access uh, planetarium show. I'm curious to know if we yeah, could I run that. I suspect we can. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, Do you uh, have a digital planet? No, no. Will we get one of the new buildings? Yes. Okay, yeah. We're going to have a new building in a couple of years. I will be gone, though. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'll pass on the torch to someone else. <laughs> Yeah, no, unfortunately, our show is entirely a digital show, so you do need to have um, one of those digital projectors that allows images to be projected. But it's also on YouTube, so Cosmic Castaways on YouTube. You can hear my voice, see Hubble images. It's very well produced by the people at Youngstown State Planetarium, or Youngstown State Ward Beecher Planetarium, to get the full title correct. Um, they did an amazing job. I just sat at my mic and read words. Cool. So do you think that, that we could, like with a data projector, project that on the dome, or do you really need the full dome uh, to watch, the, to use the video? So, so we rendered it both for flat screen and for planetarium screens. And um, so I would just watch the YouTube version in a classroom. <laughs> Okay, so that might be an option then for uh, demo shows or whatever when you when we want to try that with a bigger audience. Yeah. So that's cool. I did not realize that it was also for flat screen. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're we're careful to render things for all audiences. Awesome, cool, John. I, I hear you say render, which means you'd probably use the 3D software. <laughs> we use Blender. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, John is a convert. He uh, yeah. he's figured out all those damn menus. I I, I look at that and I get freaked out. There's so many menus I can't figure out what to do. It's so much fun. Yeah. yeah. So so we did we did abuse ourselves with Adobe After Effects and Premiere and Photoshop and Illustrator because sometimes you just need all of those tools. But the final planetarium show, everything was rendered together in, in Blender. We did end up borrowing somebody's render farm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a Blender production. Cool. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in open source and using it whenever is possible. Um, I still, unfortunately, and I hate myself for saying it, Photoshop is is so much easier on my brain than GIMP, and I wish that wasn't true, but it is. <laughs> that's, that's my level. It's still pain. I think pain is more my level. I've learned a little bit of GIMP, but that's about it. All right, we've got a question from uh, Twitter. This is Ashley Hicks. She is one of our former uh, students here. She's now a uh, graduate student at, in engineering at uh, UT Austin. She asks, 
I'm curious how Starstrider recommends getting others involved and justifying science, citizen science beyond CosmoQuest, other areas, etc. Um, so, so the justification is simple. There are more science questions than we have scientists to answer those questions. We have the data, we have the capacity, but we need human beings to sit down, pour through the data, tabulate what they see, and that's where citizen science comes in, is taking that data and transferring it into something that is publishable whether it be transferring it into something where we can now use software to get at the ages of different areas on the moon because now it's just a matter of running everyone's marking through our aggregation software or it's going through and uh, geographically sorting at what point did people see their first irises blooming. Um, we need human beings to help us solve all of the science problems that Congress and the human birth rate aren't giving us uh, the capacity and I'm kinda glad that the human birth rate is not accelerating at the same rate as our data stream from space because we've kinda gone from 600 bytes to one and a half terabytes in, in 50 years. Um, with that data comes the need for more human beings and we can use citizen scientists working in their spare time to solve all of these data and observation problems and turn them into things that the professionals can publish enabled by the citizens. Cool. That's very cool. All right. Do we have any other questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker. This has been fantastic. Thank you. It was really this evening. <laughs> Great. Well, it's added bonus that you were a uh, SPS chapter president back at University of Michigan, so you were... Michigan State, they're not the same. <laughs> Michigan State, sorry. <laughs> well, you can't hit me through the internet, so that's... <laughs> I, I'm a Spartan, not a Wolverine. They're both warlike, but one is more predictable than the other. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you... So in, in looking at our audience, and hopefully uh, others that will watch the video, uh, in talking to undergraduates, uh, you can imagine yourself talking to your former self when you were back as an undergraduate. What sort of advice would you give students now, undergraduates now, uh, that you may have wished that you had, or in seeing the lay of the land now, that you would advise students to think about as they go forward with their careers in science? Never listen to an asshole who tells you you're not smart enough to do something. Amen. And don't ever be afraid of hard work and recognize that, well, yeah, we're underpaid, we're mocked by general parts of humanity because scientists do get made fun of, even today. Um, we're the ones who get to define what humanity knows about our universe. and when someone is saying, oh, does it smell like nerd over there? I, I've, I've heard that not too infrequently. Um, those are just people who don't understand that we get to be the first people to see these amazing Hubble shots that they're now wearing on their leggings. We get to be the first people to understand uh, what are black holes, what does the Higgs boson mean? And so you just have to fight past all of the naysayers, all of the bias, and all of everything else. And if science is something that's in your blood, just keep going, and it's going to forever mean random all-nighters. It's going to forever mean working harder than anyone else you know. But it also means you get to discover the universe. Thank wow, you. Wow, that's pretty good. We're going to get that put on a t-shirt, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what we Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions? This has been a fantastic hour. All right. No? Let's give our speaker one last round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to stop the broadcast and then we can uh, just wrap up. 
Okay.